Okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us. I'm Musab Ali Abdel Karim from Nilan University in Sudan, uh, currently at the University of Cambridge in the UK. I'm one of the coordinators of uh, SONA webinar series, which is organized by the Society of Neuroscientists in Africa, Trend in Africa, and African Academy of Neurology. Uh, this webinar series is also part of uh, Worldwide Neuro Initiative. Today, we are very fortunate to have uh, Dr. Martin Kalman, who is going to talk about uh, CRISPR based functional genomics in IPS based models of brain disease. So, let me quickly introduce him. Uh, Dr. Kalman is an associate professor in the U UCSF Department of Biochemistry and Biophysics and the Institute for Neurodegenerative Diseases. Uh, he is also an, investiga an investigator at the Chan Zuckerberg Biohub. He received his uh, BA in biochemistry from Cambridge University and his PhD in biophysics and cell biology from Rockefeller University. Uh, the goal of Dr. Kabman's uh, research is to elucidate cellular mechanisms of uh, uh, brain disease and to develop new therapeutic, therapeutic strategies. Uh, he co-developed the CRISPR I and CRISPR A screening technologies, and his lab has pioneered CRISPR-based functional genomics in cell types uh, derived from induced pluripotent stem cells. A major focus of his lab is, uh, investiga is the investi investigation of uh, neurodegenerative diseases in human IBS drive neurons, astrocyte, microglia, and organoids. Uh, Dr. Kalman was named an NIH uh, director's new innovator, uh, an early distinguished investigator, Chan Zuckerberg by Hub investigator, and he received the CZI Vampire's uh, Early Career Acceleration, Acceleration Award. Uh, before we get started, I just would like to remind our audience this webinar is designed to be interactive and they can ask as many questions as they want uh, by simply typing your questions uh, into the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen and Dr. Uh, Martin will uh, reply at the end. Uh, uh, Martin, thank you very much for accepting our invitation and for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us today, and now I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you so much for this very nice and generous introduction, Masab, and thank you so much for hosting me. Uh, it's a great honor to speak to this very international audience today. Um, before I start with the science, I, uh, I will show my disclosure slide. Um, this is, uh, oh, if my computer will let me actually advance. Um, Black Lives Matter, this is the slide I've shown ever since the murder of George Floyd here in the US and um, something that uh, I think, um, you know, black lives don't just matter, they are obviously extremely precious and important and we, uh, I think, have to do much more here in the US, certainly in academia and science to uh, support our black colleagues and trainees and to address systemic racism that we have. There have been some you know, since since these events, there has been actually some very promising developments, especially also in neuroscience. So um, some of you might be aware that currently is the Black and Neuro Week, and uh, every day there's some events very much driven by trainees and young scientists. So, so some really great development in that in that department. Great. Um, so as um, Musab mentioned, um, my lab is interested in using functional genomics techniques to apply them to neuroscience and neurodegenerative diseases. So I briefly start by defining what I mean by that. Um, there's been a great progress in understanding uh, or uncovering um, the connection between genetic variants and specific diseases or uh, specific traits through human genetics. So because of the large amounts of next generation sequencing we can, we can now do, um, there's an ever-growing list of um, specific genetic variants linked to disease risk or other things. And um, in some sense that pushes the problem um, in, into the next area, which is to, uh, that we need to understand how sometimes a single base pair variant 
could act to um, uh, you know, cause a certain disease or contribute to a certain disease? What's the molecular mechanism? When and where in somebody's life do, do these um, genes play out? And ultimately, can we use that understanding to come up with better therapeutic strategies? This problem is really nicely illustrated by a uh, figure from a review from Alice Chet Plonklin's lab. So here in blue, you can see the, the number of so-called GWAS genome-wide association studies has been steadily going up over the last 10 years. But the number, the, the orange line here, is not actually the x-axis, it's the number of functional studies that have been done to understand how these GWAS um, hits act. And so you can see there's a very, wide gap here and we need much more functional work to understand how genes contribute to brain function and disease. And um, the, the approach that we use to start to help bridge that gap is functional genomics. And by functional genomics, I mean to functionally um, perturb gene function in experimental systems in order to understand what these genes do. Um, CRISPR, of course, um, is not so new anymore, and I'm sure uh, needs no, no introduction to this audience. CRISPR has really transformed the way that we can perturb and study gene function. Um, the bacterial Cas9 protease in complex with a single guide RNA can be used as a programmable nucleus to introduce cuts into the DNA, and this can be used for gene editing or, or gene inactivation. And, um, at UCSF, a group of people, uh, including myself when I was a postdoc in Jonathan Weisman's lab, uh, developed a number of variations on, these tech, uh, on this CRISPR technology um, that takes advantage of a catalytically dead version of Cas9 that we call DCAS9. This no longer cuts DNA, but it still binds DNA in a programmable way. And so that gives us now a recruitment platform that we can use to, for example, recruit transcriptional repressor domains to knock down gene expression, we call this CRISPR-I, or to recruit transcriptional activators to switch on gene expression, we call that CRISPR-A. And we showed that CRISPR-I and CRISPR-A together can perturb um, the expression of endogenous human genes in cells over many orders of magnitude in a very precise way, uh, and that we can couple this even to genome-wide screens. Um, and so today I will present some applications of, of, of this technology from my own lab. One central question that we're very interested in asking is, what controls protein aggregation and toxicity in neurodegenerative diseases? And of course, Protein aggregation has been a hallmark of neurodegeneration that we've known about for more than 100 years. Um, the fact that specific proteins aggregate in specific ways and specific cell types in the brain and that that is used by neuropathologists um, to diagnose, in fact, what disease somebody had. Um, so here you see kind of the rogues gallery of some of those proteins aggregating in specific diseases. Now, one important question we have to ask ourselves, of course, is whether uh, this protein aggregation process is actually driving and plays a causal role in disease, or whether it's just something incidental that, that is a feature of these neurons already being sick, but nothing that we would might maybe want to intervene with to stop the disease. And there are, I think, two, two lines of evidence that suggest that protein aggregation plays a causal role or something about the process of protein aggregation. Number one, um, for all of these proteins that you see here aggregating in specific diseases, there are some genetic variants, for example, point mutations in the proteins or overexpression of the proteins or even changes in the enzymes that process these proteins that cause familial early onset, often quite severe forms of these diseases. So while the majority of patients in, in many of these diseases is what we call sporadic, so we don't have a single Mendelian uh, disease gene, um, there are, is a small subfraction of patients who are, have a familial disease and oftentimes the mutations are in these proteins, which supports that there's something about those proteins uh, that is important. The other piece of evidence came actually here from my, my home institution, UCSF, um, when Stan Prusener tried to understand how infectious neurodegenerative diseases can spread. So there's a big class of diseases that includes Kuru in humans, mad cow disease, scrapie in sheep, 
and um, that is an infectious neurodegenerative disease. And he tried to set out to identify what the infectious agent is. And uh, of course, again, this is not new research. Oh, okay, sorry, because before I go to that, I was going to say that for the remainder of this talk, I mo mostly focus on tau, which is strongly associated with Alzheimer's disease along with A-beta. But if anything, tau lesions correlate better with, um, with Alzheimer's pathology. Tau is intrinsically disordered, um, and it can be binding microtubules in this extended conformation, but it can also adopt these beta sheet cross beta strand uh, structures and form fibers. And we now through cryo AM advances know what they actually look like from patient brains and intriguingly tau can adopt different structures in different diseases. So, so, and sorry, I, I, uh, I now come back to Stan Prusner's discovery that showed that the infectious agent in infectious neurodegenerative diseases such as scrapie is actually a protein, not a virus or nucleic acid. And that was a big surprise because how can proteins actually propagate information, right? They don't self-replicate the way that that um, uh, nucleic acids do. And so the, the punchline was that this protein can actually exist in at least two states, a soluble state and a disease associated state. And um, that's then named the, the prion conformation. And so uh, this state can generate seeds. Seeds can um, break off and seed more aggregation of the soluble state. And so this provides then an amplification mechanism that can drive the disease. And so again, that supports the idea that, that protein aggregation can drive disease. And in the last 10 years, um, further evidence has suggested that this might not be restricted to relatively rare diseases such as uh, uh, Kuru, but that actually the um, commonly aggregating proteins in diseases such as Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease, A-beta, tau, and alpha-synuclein, might all have prion-like properties where they spread through the brain of patients in a prion-like mechanism, although we don't think of those diseases as being infectious between people. And again, so supportive evidence comes through the fact that uh, we find pathology in these diseases to progress in a, in a spatially correlated way following actually neuroanatomical pathways. So that's suggestive, but it's not a proof. But then on the other hand, uh, people have also in the last five to 10 years established numerous animal models where they can actually take a young healthy mouse injected with a brain extract from a human patient or from a mouse model, or even synthetic protein aggregates that were purified and aggregated in vitro. And this can start to convert the pre-existing protein um, in the mouse brain into aggregates and lead to um, symptoms of uh, neurological neurodegenerative diseases. So taken together then, um, for me, I'm coming more from a cell biology background, I'm really curious to ask, okay, if proteins spread across cells like that, what are the cellular molecular mechanisms that control that process? Um, start talking about tau, what are the things that control tau production and turnover, but also what controls this aggregation? Um, in in um, tau-related diseases, tau aggregates very late in life. Um, so you could say, well, maybe, you know, it's just a reaction that has a really slow rate constant by which it aggregates. But another hallmark of neurodegenerative diseases is the fact that um, specific cell types are more vulnerable. Even, even in a tau mutant patient, um, where mutant tau is expressed in all the cells, it tends to aggregate in specific cells. And so that suggests that there are certain features of the cellular environment that can control whether or not tau aggregates. The next question is how do aggregates spread across cell boundaries? What are the pathways that they use for that? How do they trigger more aggregation? Again, in the context of a system that supposedly could clear aggregates. And lastly, a really central question is what about this process is actually toxic? And again, we have many theories about that, but no consensus at this point. So each question mark is a molecular mechanism that we would love to understand better. Um, it is possible that some of the genetic modifiers that are being identified in through human genetics act along these pathways. Um, it is again possible that some of them dictate the cell type selective vulnerability. Um, and importantly, each of these question marks is also a potential therapeutic target because if we could 
block these processes, presumably there will be a way to uh, at least slow down disease. And even if you imagine slowing down these diseases by five years or something like that, already that would have a huge public health impact. Um, so my lab has started to use these CRISPR-based screens to try, start to fill in these question marks. We started out doing this in relatively simple cell-based models in HEC293 cells, for example, um, or, or other cancer cell lines. Um, we were able to use that to identify and define the cell surface receptors that mediate tau uptake. This is, was a collaboration with Ken Kosick's lab at UC Santa Barbara, and we found that the cell surface receptors are specifically uh, sulfated heparin sulfate proteoglycans, but also a specific protein called LRP1. Um, and, and intriguingly, um, knockdown of LRP1, uh, which we identified through these, uh, these uh, cell-based approaches, knocking it down in a mouse brain was also almost completely blocking, blocking tau spreading in a mouse brain. So that was very encouraging for us to see that some of these things we can do in cell-based models validate in, a, in, a, in an animal model. Um, research in my lab then further looked at what happens after uptake and, and what controls the, the escape of tau seeds from the endolysosomal pathway to seed. And so there's more steps we, we, we need to fill in in this pathway. Um, one of the things that became clear to us though is that if we want to understand things like cell type selective vulnerability in the system, we wouldn't get that far studying it just in HEC293 cells. Um, uh, which obviously are not normally expressing tau, it's, it, uh, it's an artificial cell line. And so um, uh, therefore, you know, we thought about how can we get that cell type selective vulnerability. Of course, one thing we can do to understand that is to look in the actual patient brains um, to understand if we have vulnerable neurons and resilient neurons, what makes them different? What are the, the differences in their, in their cellular environment that might explain this vulnerability? So we could use transcriptomics or proteomics approaches to get at differentially expressed genes. And in fact, we have a project that's been driven by two students in the lab, Kuhn Lang and Emmy Lee, in collaboration with the neuropathologist Leah Greenberg at UCSF, where we were um, uh, taking um, brain regions from Alzheimer's patients, both a region that is affected late in disease and one that's affected early in disease from the same patients. And we had patients at different stages and we did single nuclear RNA sequencing to capture the transcriptomes of cells. And uh, you know, specifically focusing on excitatory neurons, we de de detected a number of different classes. And intriguingly, we were able to find markers one of them is shown here, raw B, that mark these neurons that are selectively vulnerable. So overall, excitatory neurons go down, but um, raw B neurons specifically drop out, and we can see that by, by staining as well. And intriguingly, when we look for co-localization of tau pathology with raw B, the, the raw B neurons are also the ones that accumulate more tau levels. So uh, I won't talk more about that today, and the, the, but this manuscript is on BioArchive if you want to uh, read more on that. Um, so of course, these studies can help us define um, the, 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 the kind of transcriptome and, and, and molecular nature of these resilient and vulnerable neurons. What it doesn't tell us, which of these differences are actually causally important for, for vulnerability. Um, you could imagine that a lot of the differences between different neuronal types mostly reflect their different physiological roles and, and properties. Um, so we think that CRISPR-based screens are a great complement because with the, our CRISPR-IA screening platform, we can now one at a time or in combinations control expression levels of these genes and then to ask which of them actually have an impact on vulnerability or a proxy of vulnerability that we can read out uh, in cells. And, and then that would be, um, you know, those would be potential therapeutic targets that might help to turn a vulnerable neuron into a resilient neuron. So in order to do that, we really needed to establish our screening platform in human neurons. And um, we, it, fortunately, iPSC technology makes it possible to derive different types of neurons. And Raylan Tian, a graduate student in the lab, took the lead on establishing 
um, a screening platform in such a system. We express the CRISPR I machinery in human iPSCs that we can program to neurons. And in a paper that's, that was published last, last year, I'm just summarizing here, um, Ray Lin was able to show that he can indeed use CRISPR I to very effectively knock down um, genes in human neurons, in this case, in green channel here is a, is a protein called progranulin stained um, by immunofluorescence and you can see that a guide RNA targeting this gets a very effective knockdown compared to control guide RNA. So this is a nice tool to study one gene at a time but of course we want to use this for, for genetic screens and in this case um, we did a number of screens first just for survival to ask which genes when knocked down affect survival specifically of neurons. And it was interesting to see that while there are some core essential genes that were known from other cell types, like such as cancer cell lines, um, clearly there were some genes that were, seemed to be neuron specific. So that was exciting. Um, we can also couple uh, perturbation um, of specific genes to single cell RNA sequencing readouts. So we get a whole transcriptomic fingerprint of what that perturbation does. And I show one example in a minute. And lastly, we can couple it to longitudinal imaging where we um, uh, perturb genes in, in wells of a multiball plate and then follow neurons over time. We can look at neuronal activity. So to have very rich readouts like that. Again, this is published, but I want to just highlight, um, highlight one thing about the, uh, 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 that to me was striking about the uh, looking at the transcriptomic readouts. Um, these screens give you large data sets and, and I, I appreciate that these labels are too small to read. Um, so I'm just going to um, uh, say that um, on the vertical axis, on the y-axis here, these are the genes that we perturbed. It's a relatively small number of genes that all had interesting survival phenotypes. We perturbed the same genes in iPCs and in neurons. And then on the, along the x-axis here, these are the transcripts in the cell that changed in response to that gene perturbation. Um, and you can see that there's a lot of structure to this. This is not just random. In fact, when we look at some of these clusters, these are all biologically related transcripts. Some of them make a lot of sense. So for example, here you have a whole cluster of lipid biosynthesis genes, and they all get upregulated when you knock down any other lipid biogenesis gene here. So what we would understand as a, as a classical homeostatic response. Um, and we see you know, related pattern in neurons and, and, and um, uh, iPSCs, we see some very strong differences as well. And, uh, you know, just to focus in on one thing that, that was an interesting gene to me. Um, this gene UBA1 is um, encoding um, the ubiquitin activating enzyme. So if you um, are familiar with the ubiquitination uh, kind of enzymology where you have the E1, E2, E3 uh, enzymes that help to polyubiquitinate target proteins. Um, the E1 enzymes are at the very top of that cascade. Um, there's only few, and this is the main one in humans. So not surprisingly, knocking down um, this, uh, this UBA1 um, enzyme is quite toxic in both IPCs and neurons, indicated here by the negative values. Um, and so that's not surprising because ubiquitination is important in many contexts. But when we now looked at the transcriptomic response of either iPSCs or neurons to knocking down UBA1, the surprise was that these cells reacted very differently. In the neurons here on the bottom, we saw a lot of things that I might have expected. So a lot of heat shock proteins were upregulated. Um, you know, that, that's what we see often when there's accumulation of of misfolded protein and, and you could imagine when you can't, oops, sorry, when you can't ubiquitinate that you would uh, accumulate protein and that might in induce chaperones of the heat shock response. Uh, interestingly, APOE comes up, which is an important Alzheimer's risk factor as well that's normally not highly expressed in neurons at all. Um, uh, and we see a few other changes. UBA1 is effectively knocked down, by the way, both in iPSCs and neurons. Now in iPSCs, we don't see any of these heat shock proteins going up. The signature is very different. And instead we see a downregulation of a cluster of genes, uh, the metallothionine. So that's interesting. Um, you know, they've been linked to oxidative stresses before. And so ultimately what this tells you is that knocking down the same gene in two different cell types has very different consequences. And this could be because UBA1 is important for different reasons in these different cell types. 
it's essential in both, but maybe for different reasons, or the different cell types have in fact evolved different ways to respond to the same stress. So um, both of them are very important. And I just think just highlight the importance of studying the function of a gene in the relevant uh, cell type. And intriguingly, one last point is that UBA1 is a housekeeping gene expressed in all of our cells, but um, loss of function mutations in UBA1 give patients specifically neurological disease. So again, there's something special about the functions of UBA1 specifically in neurons. Um, I, I mentioned we can also do these array screens um, that, that look at uh, one perturbation at a time. And, and this is a great way to get at complex phenotypes, maybe neural morphology, following cells over time, um, looking at neural activity, we could, for example, couple, couple this to multi-electrode multi arrays and looking at non-cell autonomous phenotypes that I'll touch on at the very end of this, this seminar. So interactions between neurons and glia, for example, or complex systems. Um, for in the first paper in collaboration with Michael Ward at the NIH, we uh, just followed neurons over time that were labeled with a fluorescent protein. And you can see um, that uh, if this movie will play, um, uh, so the first one didn't properly play. Now, now it's playing. So you can see in non-targeting control guide RNAs, um, you know, in this 14-day time lapse, we see the neuroid outgrowth. But uh, when we knock down one of the essential genes, uh, you know, neurons die. They don't grow out that much. Okay, you could say that's not so surprising because this gene came from our screen for essential genes. So neurons don't look happy. Do we learn anything? Well, it turns out there is a lot of information in looking at these unhappy neurons. Um, Ray Lin in the lab um, developed a um, bioinformatics pipeline to take these raw images of neurons and segment them. So recognize where the nuclei are, the cell bodies, um, you know, the, uh, quantify a few features like neural lengths, number of trunks and branches. And just based on the quantification of those features, he then um, calculated that for different genetic perturbations. We had each gene targeted with two guide RNAs and you can really see how um, uh, there are different effects of gene perturbation, even though the two guide RNAs targeting the same gene behave similarly. This was based on survival, but he can do it for all of these other morphological phenotypes as well. And when we take that data for all of the genes that we looked at, um, we can capture these metrics in a heat map here, color coded um, as a deviation from white, which is our non-targeting control baseline, either blue or, or red deviations. And if we cluster the, uh, the guide RNAs based on this pattern that is all captured by microscopy, you can see that a lot of the, the guides targeting the same genes uh, cluster right next to each other, which really supports that there's a lot of information in the morphology about these genes. And that is very exciting. It actually reminded me of a paper I saw where uh, machine learning was being done on children's faces and people were able to build a predictor for what genetic disease these children, ch children had based on how their face looked. So similarly, we might be able to just look at neurons and say, this gene is malfunctioning in those neurons. And uh, you know, ultimately, one of the things I'd love to do with the lab is to, to integrate different types of these, these complex phenotypes. Morphology is one, obviously, you know, thinking about neurons, one of the most interesting things about them is the neural activity that they have. Uh, you know, the electrophysiological properties and network properties that we can look at in these iPSC drive neurons, uh, transcriptomics, as I mentioned, and other ways in which we can get a lot of information, for example, looking at subcellular structure and function. So a big challenge will be how to integrate all of these um, uh, and how to understand, for example, whether specific features in the transcriptomics map to a specific feature in the morphology or in the uh, electrophysiological activity. To start to make it possible to kind of do these systematic comparisons and to also uh, in, um, work together with the whole scientific community, um, we actually launched a, um, a, a web portal called CRISPR Brain. This was a really great collaboration with a group called Data Technica International. And um, CRISPR Brain is a data commons where such genetic screens for different phenotypes and in different cell types um, are, are curated and, and made uh, comparable. Um, so uh, we'd love 
people to use the website to give us feedback. So if you wanted to go to the site and, and to have a look at it, um, we would love to get your feedback. You can also follow us on Twitter or give us feedback via the website. And we'd love for people um, to contribute and, and make suggestions. So, um, uh, so I, I'm, I'm quite hopeful that this will become a real exciting venue to, uh, to answer all of these important questions. All right, so, so one of the motivations that we wanted to establish uh, screening in iPSC-derived human cell types is that we can generate them directly from patients, right? So we can, uh, if a patient donates a blood or skin cell that we can reprogram into an iPSCs. Um, if the patient has a known disease variant, we can even do CRISPR engineering to make an isogenic control. And then we can equip these cells, these iPC lines with the CRISPR machinery and guide RNAs and uh, differentiate them into cell types that we think are important for the disease. It could be neurons, but it could be microglia, maybe astrocytes, other cell types as well. Um, and then we could try to see if we can observe that the, the, that the cells carrying the disease variant show a cellular difference, a cellular defect maybe, that reflects what goes wrong in the disease. Uh, and people have obviously in the, in the iPSC field found uh, quite a few great examples for, for such phenotypes. But oftentimes we don't understand how you go from a single base pair change in the genome to a cellular defect that then might, might be contributing or causing disease. Um, so mod genetic modifier screens on top of the system would be a great way to, to find that. So you could imagine if you use the phenotype that you think is disease relevant, you do a genetic modifier screens to ask what genes control that phenotype. Um, and you do it in parallel in the control background and in the disease background, you'll find a lot of things along the diagonal. So things that will basically affect whatever your readout is in both cell types. But you might find a few things that are modifiers specifically in the disease background and not the healthy background. And if you will, these are genes that genetically interact with the disease variant. And um, those could give you a lot of clues for how the disease variant uh, causes uh, the cellular phenotype. And of course, a subset of those that, that basically correct the cellular defect are potential therapeutic targets. So that was very abstract. So let's actually look at the first example from our lab where we're doing this. And again, coming back to tau, um, in this case, we're looking at actually some of the earliest steps of spontaneous aggregation or oligomerization of soluble tau in neurons uh, to apply this, this paradigm. And this is work led by a postdoc, Avi Samuelson, in the lab. We obtained actually isogenic iPSC lines from our collaborator, Lee Gan, um, that have a point mutation in tau um, that's linked to frontotemporal dementia, V337M, versus wild type lines. And Avi characterized neurons that he differentiated from those cells. He saw, for example, that at six weeks of differentiation, the V337M neurons had much higher levels of phospho tau, stained here with the 88 antibody that neuropathologists often use to detect tau pathology, for example, in Alzheimer's brains, compared to wild type. So that was interesting. Um, at even earlier times, um, Avi observed that if he uses a confirmation-specific antibody that detects tau oligomers, the so-called T22 antibody, that um, the V337M neurons accumulate tau oligomers detected by this antibody, uh, inter interestingly, around the soma of the cells uh, compared to wild type. And um, that enabled Avi to set up a flow cytometry-based assay as well. So he can dissociate those neurons, stain them with tau oligomer antibody, and then um, do flow cytometry. And he, he again saw that the V337M neurons had uh, at least a subpopulation with high levels of tau oligomers compared to wild type. So because this, uh, this could be assayed by flow cytometry, uh, we were able then to turn this into a genome-wide modifier screen where we used fact sorting. So we took these neurons, expressed CRISPR-I machinery and guide RNAs, differentiated them into glutamatergic neurons, and stained them for the levels of tau oligomers. And then we did fact sorting to physically separate those neurons that had high levels of tau um, oligomers from those with low levels of tau. And then we did next generation sequencing in the, those two populations in order to uncover which genes might control the levels of tau oligomers in cells. This is a volcano plot. This is how we often show the results from a genome-wide screen where we have um, uh, 
On the x-axis, the phenotypes, so positive values here mean an increase in tau oligomers when the gene is knocked down. Uh, negative values means decrease in tau oligomers when the gene is knocked down, and the y-axis tells us the st st statistical significance of that. Um, there were many, many modifier hits. One of the strongest ones was MAPT tau itself, so that was very reassuring to us to see that knocking down tau, you have less tau oligomers. It's almost like a positive control. It is also a reminder that in this particular screen, um, we just looked at tau oligomers and did not correct for levels of total tau. So for example, uh, we would also pick up modifier hits that just lower tau altogether. Um, but that was by design because um, there's a great interest therapeutically for strategies that lower tau uh, in general and um, uh, tr trials with antisense oligos are underway to see whether tau lowering is beneficial. But um, of course, antisense oligos is not necessarily a scalable uh, affordable uh, therapy worldwide. So we are very interested to find other maybe uh, targets that we could target with simple small molecules to make it possible to lower tau. So, so that's why we're very interested in this. And we're now doing secondary screens to understand which of our hits control tau levels versus tau oligomer levels. We found a few other interesting patterns in the data. For example, uh, a whole who is who of the of the molecular factors that are involved in the first steps of autophagy, uh, initiation of autophagy, when we knock down any of them, we get an increase in tau oligomer, suggesting that autophagy is a clearance mechanism. And that had been described by other people. Whereas on the other side, knocking down mTOR um, uh, is actually decreasing um, tau oligomers. And that was um, actually something um, interesting because mTOR is known, um, mTOR inhibition is known to induce autophagy. So it's possible that knocking down mTOR in fact boosts these factors and thereby lowers tau oligomers. And interestingly, um, just last month, there was a paper coming out from Steve Haggerty's lab at Harvard Medical School. They looked at compounds that would be able to rescue neurons from, from tau. And uh, they found also that uh, mTOR or other related mTOR inhibitors and related compounds that boost autophagy would be good. So in some sense, this was nice for us to see the fact that this screen would, would come to the same conclusion of what would be potential therapeutic targets. And of course, we have found many more hits that lower tau oligomers that we're currently investigating uh, further. Um, now, the last thing on tau that I'm going to mention is that, uh, of course, we, the, the big mystery still is also what about this process of tau aggregation and misbehavior is actually toxic to neurons. We wanted to also address that in an unbiased way. Greg Moll, a student in the lab, um, was able to establish an essay that other people had uh, reported, which is that uh, when you use very low concentration of rotenone, um, an inhibitor of the mitochondrial complex one, um, uh, these are very low concentrations. So wild type neurons actually um, are not sensitive to those low concentrations, but V337M tau mutant neurons show sensitivity. So that's interesting. When we knock down tau in those neurons, this is almost completely rescued. So that's an important control to show it's really depending on the tau in these mutant neurons. And when we take another hit from AVI screen, that abrogated tau aggregation, in this case, it did not change total tau levels, but it also um, rescued cells from, uh, from this toxicity or, or, or hyper vulnerability. And so this is supportive of a model where really um, something, you start with soluble tau and when it's more aggregation prone, then, um, then there's some toxic consequence for the cell. And the initial screen looked at aggregation, so it might help us identify factors that block aggregation. Um, but the second screen in some sense is, is complementary that Greg is now doing. He's looking directly at blocking toxicity. And so he might find some things that, that don't stop tau aggregation, but that block the resulting toxicity and that teaches something about toxicity mechanism. And of course, if we think of the disease progression as, as this kind of arrow, um, we're also very interested to find therapeutic targets that might rescue neurons even when tau aggregation has already begun. Um, in the last uh, a few minutes of the talk, um, I will tell you one more story that's very recent um, and published, uh, but on BioArchive right now, um, where we actually used our system to really, I think, understand a, a whole path, new pathway in neurons. And, and, and so I wanted to share that with you. Um, this is work, as I said, it's on BioArchive if you want to read the details um, that started with the big question, how do neurons deal with oxidative stress? 
So oxidative phosphorylation is an important uh, way for cells to generate uh, energy, of course, but it has a byproduct of reactive oxygen species, which can create damage by damaging other macromolecules in the cell. The brain should be quite vulnerable to reactive oxygen species because it consumes so much oxygen. Um, even though it's only 2% of the body weight, it consumes 20% of oxygen. Um, it's also very rich in polyunsaturated fatty acids, which are very prone to oxidation. And is specifically within the brain, if we think about neurons, neurons are post-mitotic, they're the longest living cells in the body probably, and they are very much reliant specifically on oxidative phosphorylation. There's actually a developmental switch where neuronal progenitor cells are more relying on glycolysis for energy metabolism, but uh, when they differentiate into neurons, they really switch to oxidative phosphorylation. So again, all of these reasons make us think that neurons must have some kind of a mechanism to deal with the oxidative stress that's a byproduct of oxidative phosphorylation to keep them healthy over many decades. Um, but then it, it's likely that during aging or in the context of specific diseases, some of those mechanisms fail and contribute to the oxidative stress and damage that is in fact observed in disease and in, in old brains. So we want to understand what are these response factors. And um, for that, um, uh, I, this was another project driven by Relin in the lab, working with Jason and AJ, um, two, two technicians in the lab. And uh, for this, um, we uh, did a screen in neurons again, based on facts. But here we stained for levels of reactive oxygen species using a small molecule dye, or for levels of uh, peroxidated uh, lipids for which there's also a small dye. And so um, again, these are the volcano plots. And there was one gene that really caught our attention, which was one of the top hits in the screen. And this gene is called prosaposin or prosaposin. Um, this gene, intriguingly, and this happened after we, uh, we finished our study, was recently described to also be linked to Parkinson's disease. So a specific point mutation in, uh, in, a, in a part of this protein is, uh, is linked to familial Parkinson's disease. So, so that was very interesting to us um, when we heard that. We were able to validate the fact that um, uh, knocking down or knocking out prosaposin uh, creates higher levels of oxidative stress and oxidative lipids in neurons. Interestingly, that was neuron specific. So in stem cells, these are the exact same cells from which the neurons are derived. There's no effect. And also not if we just pick another cell line like HEC293 cells. So prosoposin is seems to have a neuron specific role, or at least, you know, some specific to some cell types in controlling uh, reactive oxygen species. And that is a surprise because prosoposin is actually acting in the lysosomes. Um, so prosoposin is made up of these four subunits, um, supposin A through D, and in the lysosome, um, a, a protease called cathepsin D cleaves this into these uh, individual supposins. There's also a separate protein called GM2A that very much uh, looks like one of the supposins, and together these assist hydrolases in degrading specific lipids, glycosphingolipids. So the supposins are in, in, in some sense the adapters that help to solubilize lipids uh, and, and uh, deliver them to hydrolases for degradation. So the first thing we tested in our neurons then was whether knockout of prosoposin um, prevents um, uh, degradation of glycosphingolipids, and we have an antibody against a specific one, GM1, and indeed knock prosoposin knockout neurons accumulate higher levels of, uh, of GM1, um, as you might expect. Um, we actually did uh, some un, uh, not unbiased uh, lipidomics as well, and that showed us as well that the lipids that accumulate when we knock out prosoposin in neurons are glycosphingal lipids and also some polyunsaturated fatty acids, so these green and, and uh, orange dots here. Um, but how does that lead to um, uh, oxidative stress? We had a closer look. One of the things that we noticed was that if we use a lysosomal marker, a LAMP2 in this case, um, lysosomes looked very different in prosoposin knockout neurons. They were very big um, and, and filled almost the entire cytosol here. And um, when we now look by super resolution uh, microscopy um, with a colleague at Berkeley, Keshu, um, at GM1, the accumulation of this ganglious uh, uh, sphingolipid um, 
did in, indeed overlap with these really big blown up uh, lysosomes. One question is, are these lysosomes, uh, you know, is the cell somehow proliferating lysosomes um, because there's a defect with prosopocins and making more functional lysosomes? Or are these actually dysfunctional lysosomes? We did one assay to check whether they are actually um, active in autophagy, uh, looking at this protein LC3B1, B that can be um, uh, lipidated and then turned over um, in the context of autophagy. Um, when we block the, this lysosomal degradation of autophagosomes by adding baphylomycin, um, normally you would always expect that there's an increase in the LC3B because that's normally turned over, but it accumulates when you block its degradation. And we saw that um, while that was true in wild type cells, in these prosopocin knockout cells, while you had more of these, there was no turnover. So suggesting that in fact, autophagy was dysfunctional and blocked. Okay, so um, we knock down a lysosomal protein, we, we start to have these big dysfunctional lysosomes, but again, how does it connect to oxidative stress? Um, we checked, in fact, whether those neurons are more sensitive to oxidative stress. So um, their normal survival is the same, um, but if we grow them in the absence of antioxidants that are a normal component of the neuronal media, you suddenly see a very dramatic difference that the prosopocin neurons die very dramatically in the absence of antioxidants. Um, we asked how do they die by adding, um, for example, inhibitors of apoptosis, but none of these apoptosis inhibitors were able to block uh, the cell death. So we do think that there was a different form of cell death happening. We did a, a genetic modifier screen for cell survival by growing neurons plus minus antioxidants and looking for genetic modifiers. A lot of the hits were the same, but there was a cluster of genes that was only required for neuronal survival in the absence of antioxidants. And intriguingly, GPX4, the strongest of them, is glutathione peroxidase 4, which is known to be required for cells to uh, uh, not undergo ferroptosis, uh, an oxidative form of cell death. And intriguingly, these other strong factors are all acting in the pathway that helps to insert a selenocysteine in the active sites of GPX4. So, so this entire pathway seemed to be important, suggesting that ferroptosis might be how these neurons die. And indeed, um, ferroptosis is a cell death pathway where free iron accumulates in cells, generating reactive oxygen species, peroxidizing liquids leading to ferroptosis. It can be blocked pharmacologically by chelating iron or counteracting this lipid peroxidation. And in fact, when we use those compounds, we can fully rescue the survival of prosopocin neurons. Um, so uh, how does prosopocin loss lead to this cascade that, that leads to ferroptosis? We did some electron microscopy on, on these neurons as well. Um, we knew they had big lysosomes, but what was interesting to see by electron microscopy is that these big lysosomes were extremely electron dense and, um, and so this is, was actually very reminiscent of what people describe at lipofusin, where, um, where old cells in the body accumulate these dense structures of, um, that, that contain lipids. It's sometimes called H pigment. Um, it's typically autofluorescence, that's a hallmark. And indeed, in our prosopocin knockout neurons, these were also autofluorescence. And Intriguingly, this electron density um, is probably related to accumulation of iron. We can stain for iron in our neurons. And again, prosopocin knockout it leads to accumulation of iron. And this iron stain here co-localizes with the lysosomes. Um, so basically then that brought us to our model. Once you have problems with um, glycosynthelipids accumulation in the lysosome, um, one of the things that we observed is cholesterol accumulation. I didn't talk about that today, but you also form lipofusin. You accumulate these lipids. They trap iron. We have dysfunctional lysosomes that don't do autophagy, but the iron um, can also promote a Fenton reaction that generates reactive oxygen species. In fact, that reaction is promoted by the low pH of the lysosomes, and then that can peroxidase uh, lipids and lead to neuronal ferroptosis. And we think um, that this might well be um, relevant in disease given, given um, the prosopocin link to Parkinson's disease and generally the importance of, uh, of oxidative stress to neurodegenerative disease.
I think in the interest of time, I will skip over my, my, uh, my last, my, the other two slides I have, which were just to say, I talked about neurons all the time, but glia are really important. For example, microglia are really important for Alzheimer's disease. And so we have screening systems in other cell types like microglia and also assembloids where we want to look at the interaction of neurons and glia in a very defined model. Um, and so in the interest of time, I just skip to my last slide to thank my wonderful lab members, our collaborators who I have um, acknowledged and, and our funding sources. And, and uh, yeah, um, thank you so much for listening and I'm, I'm looking forward to your questions. Okay, thank you so much for this wonderful and stimulating talk. Actually, we have got a few questions, but uh, while people gather their thoughts and come up with more questions, let me ask if you could give uh, our young audience in particular some sort of general career advice. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think one piece of career advice that I have is um, as a trainee in science, it's so important to be in a good mentorship environment. So I think um, when you decide which lab you want to join um, for part of your training, maybe for your PhD or postdoc or as an undergraduate, um, you know, one thing to think about is, of course, the science. You want to be excited about the science, but also think about whether it's a good mentorship environment. Is it a positive environment? Are people supportive? Are there people who have time to, to talk to you about science and, and teach you? And, and that should maybe both be the group leader, but also other people working in the lab. So, so that will be maybe my number one advice. Okay, fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, so let me go ahead and try to read uh, some of the questions. Uh, and I will start with this one. Although protein aggregation seem uh, deleterious, could formation of protein aggregates be a trade-off in, in an attempt by the brain to resist neurodegeneration? That's an excellent question. Absolutely. I think this is, this is a great question, right? When we look in late stage, uh, you know, brains uh, post-mortem, we see these big aggregates, but ultimately it's quite possible that those cells that survived and have these big aggregates are in fact the cells that found a way to protect themselves from to toxicity, maybe by generating larger aggregates. Um, and um, there's a number of lines of evidence to say that it's actually more the smaller oligomers and earlier stages that might be toxic. Again, we don't know, I don't think we have consensus of the mechanism of toxicity, but several people have supported the idea that it's smaller oligomers that are important. And that was in fact one of the motivations that we did our screen in neurons based on oligomers rather than looking for the biggest aggregates because absolutely they might be protective. Uh, okay, so the next one is, since tau expression usually don't occur in juvenile in real life, why do knockdown with IBSC and, and not relatively other neurons? I don't know if you... Oh, sorry, can you say uh, that? Can I, okay, so since tau expression usually don't occur in juvenile in real life, oh, okay. why do uh, knockdown with IBSC not relatively other adult neurons? Um, so tau is actually expressed in neurons as soon as they develop, including in, f in fetal neurons. Um, maybe the question gets at the fact that there are different isoforms of tau. And, and one of the interesting features of tau is that there are 4R and 3R tau isoforms and that the 4R isoforms generally come up late in life. Um, in Alzheimer's disease, we see aggregations that involve 3R and 4R tau. There are other tau apathies where we only see 3R or 4R. And certainly um, the iPSC neurons, I think that's where the question is coming from. It's a great question. They are like young neurons, right? They are developmentally not as mature and they naturally express almost only 3R tau. Um, we, we chose the V337M mutation because it's actually included in the 3R tau versus some other mutations are not. Um, it would be very interesting to be able to model the 4R expression and some people are working on that and to, to be able to get at that. Mm -hmm. In this case, yeah, we, we do see 3R tau and it, and it does um, aggregate. So this is some sort of follow-up to the same question, to the previous questions. Uh, based on the differential transcriptomic signatures between mouse neurons and IBSC, what could be the implication of modeling neurodegeneration in IBSC? 
Yeah, I think um, th th that's an important question. And I think comparing mouse to human IPSC models, it's very clear that these have complementary strengths and weaknesses, right? So I think on one hand, the mouse models are powerful because they are, um, you know, you can look at uh, cells in a real brain context and the interaction between different cell types is clearly going to be really important. Uh, you can look at old mice, you can mature cells and so on. So th there, there are important advantages and, and reasons why so much of the research has focused on mouse. Um, I would say some of the limitations of mouse models are that the, these mice generally don't naturally develop neurodegenerative diseases. So you have to really often push this push the model quite strongly by overexpressing these human disease proteins. Um, and, uh, and, but again, there are now more physiological mouse models, I think, as well, that have more subtle phenotypes. When you think about understanding genetics and genetic variants, though, I think um, it's also important to point out that a lot of the GWAS studies uncover um, changes in non-coding regions, actually. And they might have complex effects on gene expression and so on. And so sometimes, the, we, in, in a mouse model, we couldn't even model that specific variant because that part of the genome is not directly conserved. So I think to understand, to get at more of the, the, the human genetics, there are also big advantages of doing it in human cells and being able to in fact take cells directly from a human patient. Uh, okay, so uh, someone is asking about uh, uh, the open science database that you mentioned of, uh, of, of, of CRISPR. He is asking if you could give us more information about that. And someone also asking the same question, is the CRISPR platform you, you describe amenable to proteomics? This is because more sample input is usually required for proteomics compared to transcriptomics. Great question. Um, yes, I think it, it would be very exciting to do more proteomics. We have done that in some cases. I, I, with the one story I showed you, lipidomics, right? But we have not done it in high throughput. So in, in, in those cases, we would generally look at only a few genes and grow enough neurons and knock down different genes. And then you could do lipidomics, you could do proteomics on them. Certainly, we are not quite there yet to do this in a genome-wide way. That would be very exciting. There are some people who are looking at other ways of doing proteomics that are antibody-based as opposed to mass spec-based and um, that use ways to multiplex a lot of antibodies to look at protein levels, many different protein levels, for example, based on sequencing, where you could couple uh, antibodies to oligonucleotides. So there might be some ways to ultimately do proteomics, but not based on mass spec, but based on some other technologies. Okay, so have you tried to do your uh, Cas9 screens in uh, brain organoids, and what are the findings compared to eye neurons? We haven't done them in brain organoids. Uh, I showed on one of the last slides that we are building these 3D uh, co-cultures of uh, neurons and astrocytes and microglia. And Emmy Lee in the lab, a student, has done some pilot screens and has already found that absolutely there are some differences. And, and for example, what controls neuronal survival can be different in this 3D assembloid than in a 2D model. And so I, ultimately, I think the interaction between neurons and glia um, uh, will play a really important role. So it's definitely something we're very excited about looking, looking more into. Okay, so the next one. Regarding the IPSC from patients, uh, does the stage of the disease determine what cells are resilient or vulnerable, and thus their genetic signature? Could temporal, temporal uh, variability in what cells uh, are vulnerable or, resili or resilient affect the translational impact of your approach to the general population of people suffering from these disease? Great question. Um, yeah, I would say that oftentimes uh, f several of, the, of these diseases have a pattern where early on in disease, there, there are more specific subtypes of neurons that are affected in specific brain regions, for example, but that later in disease, more neurons are affected as well beyond that. You know, I mean, um, obviously some of the early phenotypes in Parkinson's disease are linked to to um, dopaminergic neurons and the substantia nigra being affected. But later on in disease, other brain regions are affected. So it's less selective later on as the disease becomes more dramatic. Um, so, so uh, you know, um, absolutely, you could say that, you know, maybe, um, and I think this is a general point. I think 
probably you would ideally like to intervene as early as possible, right? And, and uh, later on, I think uh, more cell types become vulnerable as the disease progresses and it might be harder to rescue, rescue the cells. Okay, so we are relatively running out of time. So let me ask this final question. Let me pick one of many questions that we have received and I would like also in advance to apologize for our audience for not being able to answer all the questions. So this is the last one that I, will, I would like to pick. You mentioned that the spread of uh, a disease protein expression, for example, in the brain depend on the environment or the niche in different structure. So what are the best way to use IBS uh, to, model the, to model a disease as they may change their behavior or proteomic profile according to uh, the, the, how they have been cultured outside the brain, either in a plate or you know, as a xenograph? I don't know if you get the question or yeah. do you want me? Okay. I, I think one, one of the aspects in the question is a, is a very important point, which is the fact like, you know, can we even study selective vulnerability outside the brain and spreading? Um, and I, I definitely agree that that's an important concern, right? Ultimately, all of our model systems are only models. They're reductionist models that hopefully capture something important, but that are not going to be a complete copy of what happens in the brain, right? And that, that is true for spreading, that's true for vulnerability, for vulnerability. So again, the hope is that we use these cell-based models as a platform that we can scale quite well and where we can ask a lot of questions about a lot of genes. But then once we have a hypothesis based on that, that we also go back to test it, either make testable predictions in human brain tissue or as, it, as we did in the case of LRP1, um, knock it down in a mouse model, for example, and ask, does this now work in the context of an actual brain? Okay, so would you like to provide like closing remarks for our audience before we close today? Uh, well, I would say, um, uh, you know, um, being in science has its challenges, you know, and I think everybody knows that on many levels, but it also has great rewards. And I'm always so excited to, um, yeah, um, uh, talk to the next generation of scientists and and uh, and hear from them. Um, I think um, there are so many exciting developments in terms of um, the kind of data we have access to, the, the kind of um, tools we have that I think um, in neuroscience in particular, I think we, we, we're looking forward to very exciting next years and, and it's, it's great, uh, yeah, to, to have such okay. a vibrant scientific community. Okay, so with that, let me again thank you, Martin, for this wonderful talk and, and uh, discussion and also our audience for the nice questions and comments and bye for now. Thank you for having me. All right.